We continue our conversation with the pastor of Gwinnett Church in Metropolitan Atlanta, Jeff Henderson, who joins us here on the set of Eastside Baptist Church. We are in Marietta, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, you and I are serving two congregations, and it's good to see you. It's great to see you, John. Um, I, wanna, I want people to know you better. You, you're, you're, you're pastoring a big old church in Gwinnett County, but you didn't start out with ministry, I think, being <laughs> the, the primary thing. You grew up a pastor's son in Norcross, Georgia, um, but you ended up uh, after college, did you go to work for Chick-fil-A uh, early on or was that a, bit, a little bit later? Because you that were was, in business, I guess that's my bigger point. That's right, yes. I, I, my dad as a pastor said, if you can do anything and not do ministry and be satisfied, that's a win. My father who was in ministry gave me the same advice. So we tried <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I went to- I'm uh, still trying. That's right, that's right. <laughs> And I love the business world and I'm still, as you are, still in it to some extent, yeah. but, but I, I grew up in Atlanta and I was a big sports fan. So my first job was with the Atlanta Braves and I was in their promotions department. What this, years were you with the Braves? 88 and 89. That was okay years. Yeah, was, Dale Murphy years. Yeah. And then, uh, but then and obviously in the nineties, everything oh, changed. Yeah. And then, but I was gone from them. So <laughs> we, were, we were doing everything to try to get people to, to uh, the stadium. But I really learned a lot about marketing and advertising and eventually worked for a couple of um, attractions in, in, in Atlanta, Lake Lanier Islands, Callaway Gardens. Mm -hmm. And I did some promotions with Chick-fil-A, which if your audience isn't familiar with Chick-fil-A, they need to be familiar with Chick-fil-A. I think most Canadians, most Canadians, when they're making their way through the United States, will find a Chick-fil-A. Try to find. Not so, once, but several times. So it's, a, it's an amazing organization, but I work, basically my job, I was over their sports marketing division and their beverage marketing division. So did that for six years. So I spent a number of years in the business world, love the business world, but we at North, we were drawn to a church called North Point Community Church, and right. they were in the process of launching their first multi-site location or in the business world, their first franchise. And long story short, conversations came to me that you're in the franchise business. You, you grew up in a church, you know us. Could you help us launch this first franchise or this first multi-site. And you had no idea what that lead to, did you? No, not at all. So <laughs> here, here, here we are. And I never, I never, ne never thought I would be doing this. Obviously, I, I, I promised God I would never, ever, ever work at a church. So never tell God you're never going to do anything. So that was part of the, part of the journey. My wife is amazing and it's a long story, but we just decided this is what we were supposed to do. And that's been 13 years ago. And so we've la helped launch two churches since then. And it's, we've seen God do some remarkable things. Well, you run, if you will, and I say this in a, and I hope a, an appropriate way, but there are serious business components in, in running churches or not-for-profits that are the size of North Point and Buckhead and, and now Gwinnett. So it's had to have helped you, not only uh, as uh, understanding the nuts and bolts of business, but especially in marketing to understand what the needs of people are out there and uh, to help them understand in our context the, the, the need to respond to that spiritual desire they have in their lives. People often ask me, what's the biggest difference between Chick-fil-A and doing what I do now? And I say the biggest difference is I'm open on Sundays. You know, at Chick-fil-A, <laughs> I was closed on Sundays, but I'm open on Sundays in this job. And, Great answer. Great answer. But I quickly realized that, and you, will, you know this incredibly well, it's leadership and people are people and you can have church or business but at the end of the day and there's the mission vision all that's incredibly important but at the end of the day you're leading people that's right, relationships. and principles are transferable mm -hmm. values are transferable and so i was dipped in this chick-fil-a culture and put into this culture and it's been great i, I feel like i've worked in the best business culture and i've worked in the be one of the best church cultures but there's so many similarities in terms of how you treat people how you cast vision how you maintain mission and strategy and values and all of that. And one of the challenges you have, and maybe it's true in some aspects of big events that Chick-fil-A may do, but when you go into a church in the size of scale that you're leading, the number of volunteers right. that you have to depend upon in order to deliver what it is you have to deliver every weekend. Right. That's another level of leadership that sometimes I don't think for-profit people fully understand or appreciate. And it really requires that you re you repeat your mission and vision over and over and over again. Well said. And if you've ever been to Chick-fil-A, you may have heard when you say thank you, they say our pleasure. Well, I was there when the late founder of Chick-fil-A, True Cathy, wanted us to say that, but it took the organization it took them about seven years to have that filter in that kind of language. And that was always a reminder to me, here's the guy that invented the chicken sandwich and it took him seven years for all of the staff employees at the restaurants to say, when you say thank you, they say our pleasure. 
Okay, so leadership plays a great part in what you do, and God's provided you with some great teams. But I think something has happened, and I say this as someone who does a little bit of communication, you have really become known as, a, as an outstanding communicator, and, oh, and, and, um, and I don't mean that for flattery, I just as one guy who does that to another guy who does it a whole lot better, well done, I salute well, you. Well, thank you. Um, what, what can you teach us or tell us when you're communicating uh, on, a, on a stage like this, when there's the spotlight, before that presentation happens, there's a lot of preparation that has to take mm -hmm. place, not mm -hmm. just prayerful preparation, but study and thinking it through. And you have certain, you have, I, I think I read an article by you of five ways to, 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 to make, this is a crew, the crude topic, but five ways to fail as a communicator, <laughs> or five things you do. It's very encouraging uh, article, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> but communication, I, I, I would think innately, being a preacher's kid, and having leadership skills in, in your life and getting up and doing presentations as a marketing person. Um, you have some communication skills, but it's gone to a whole nother level since you're, you know, you're in this arena you're in now. What, just talk to us a little about what you're learning about communication. Help us a little bit. Well, the first is the better you prepare, the better you present or the better you prepare, the better you preach. And no one really teaches us how to prepare. We, we, we can study and all that's incredibly important. Sure. But at the end of the day, we can skimp on our, if we skimp on our preparation and just lean on our natural talents, it'll eventually show up. And so I try to teach um, our staff communicators. In fact, I just came from a session where I was teaching our staff communicators some of the things they need to do to help their preparation process. And one of the things I encourage them is before they get up on a platform, they practice the talk at least four or five times. Out loud. Out loud. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is it's actually going to allow you to speak shorter messages. And typically, and this is very, and I understand this in the business world, if you've got to give a presentation in the business world, then the first question people usually ask is, how long do I have? You don't want to ask that question. The question you need to ask is, how long do I need to speak to make an impact? And usually the shorter, the better. And so by practicing four or five times, you're able to edit, 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 and yeah. condense and have a shorter message. It's, it's why if you look at the best movie for Oscars, it's the, the movie that usually wins best movie also wins best editing. And a talk or a message is pretty much like a movie. So the better you get at editing your talks, the better you get as being a communicator. And ironically, the shorter the message, typically the better. Uh, my best sermons, honestly, I think best prep I ever did was uh, I, I do it with an ironing board as like my table yeah, my yeah, pulpit, great. and in front of a mirror I've done, I, I do that still do that mm -hmm. still still practice phrases in the car transitional phrases I try to those are those are those are things that I do yeah. and they are all cumulative together by the time you come together to communicate something you, you feel like you've, you've got it let's talk about topics um, you have a multi diverse audience out there you're you're gearing toward the unchurched and yet you want to be so convictional about who Christ is. You want to, to, to be so convictional about how hopeful you are about this mm -hmm. truth of the gospel and how this word, this Bible can mm -hmm. penetrate a life. How do you approach the topics? You, you, you've got to prepare your heart, but you've got to go before that even to find out where we're we going as far as themes are concerned. How right. do you do that as a communicator? Well, typically we'll have a sermon planning calendar so that we have a balanced diet of what to talk about. Do you have a team that speaks into mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Kind of walk us through what that's like. Well, and I have a, a, a staff team, but for a lot of pastors, they don't have a staff team. Right. But you, you have people that attend their church. It could be volunteers people that are business people that understand this. And, and communicators in churches should be secure enough to bring a team together and say, can you help me process that? Absolutely. It, it just takes their communication to a new level. Absolutely. Top of, top of and it allows you, it invites you to get feedback before you give the message. If you're able to get feedback before you get the message, then typically the feedback after the message is going to be better. And, but I think you Good have point. to be, I have to be in constant sermon preparation mode. You, be, you have to be on high alert for all I've heard Andy Stanley, my boss, say often when people say, how long did it take you to prepare that message? He said, oh, about 20 years. Uh, you just have to constantly be in sermon prep mode. I remember my dad used to invite my friends over in high school. My mom would bake some cookies, he would have some milk, and he would invite my friends over, and he would ask them, what's going on in your life? Tell me what's going on. And he cared for my friends, but what I didn't know at the time is sermon prep. he was doing sermon prep. Yeah. And so trying to talk to as many a diverse group of people as possible. 
is really, really important and you're listening and you're learning. Now, there are the things that God needs to place on your heart and that happens as well. So there's this wonderful, beautiful thing that happens when in terms of finding, finding a topic and go, I wanna talk about that. Um, let's finish with this. You try to conclude a message with, so what, what's the big deal? Right. I've been talking to you now for 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. So what? Right. Open that up for us before we go. Well, another question we wanna end is, is what do I want them to do? What, what do I want you to do with this information? And if I can't answer that question, then I probably haven't, you know. It was a nice speech. <laughs> right. Yeah. I remember the first time I went over my talk with Andy Stanley and uh, I was going through my preparation. And so we get to the end, he puts, puts all the notes away and he says, so what do you want them to do? So every, you're done, you walk off, people are leaving, what do you want them to do? To which I replied, John, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, okay, you still have work to do. Because okay. until you answer that question, you have, we want this to be actionable. What are people going to do? And so, for an example, I did a talk not too long ago about relationships, and I said, so this week, I want you to ask three people this question, what's it like to be on the other side of me? What's it like to be on the other side of me? Because you don't know what it's like to be on the other side of me. I don't know what it's like. So do that, everybody. So I want us to repeat this out loud. That's their homework. Right. What's it like to be on the other side of me? See you next Sunday. And so we want to be, we just want to let people know. And we, we call it the water cooler moment. Um, yeah. If it's on Wednesday and somebody says, what'd you do? I went to church. Oh, what, what, what did the preacher talk about? That's, that's very important. And it's not just important in the church world. It's important in business world as well. Okay, so you go do a talk in front of your employees or whatever, five days later, did you give them so much information that they don't, they can't absorb it? Or did you give them one primary takeaway? And we call it the single most persuasive idea. And you know where I learned that from? Chick-fil-A. What is the single most persuasive idea? Eat more chicken. It's not everything they will have to say, but that's the single most persuasive idea. And so what's the single most persuasive idea in this particular talk? That's hard to do, but it's really important. Well, throughout our time together, you've been seeing on the lower third of our screen uh, websites and information about Jeff Henderson. And I hope that you that are um, in a position where you're communicating, you have responsibilities to cast vision, uh, to, to try to get people to get from here to here on their journey. It may be in business, it may be you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jeff has been uniquely gifted by God to be able to do that. And he leads a, a wonderful church, a great organization that's making a huge difference. And I'm so grateful that we've had time to talk today. Thanks for coming by and, and uh, being a part of this 100 Huntley Street in the U.S. experience. I'm so honored. Congratulations to you and everything that's going on here. Thanks so much, Jeff.